All right, uh, this talk is about sample efficient learning of uh, quantum antibody systems. I'm Mehdi Soleimani a graduate student at MIT, and this is joint work with Anurag Anshu, Srinivasan, Arunan Shalom, and Tomataka Kobahar. Uh, so before telling you about learning quantum systems, let me uh, begin with reviewing some of the things we know about learning their classical counterpart. Uh, so suppose we have n binary random variables arranged on the vertices of a bounded degree graph. Uh, also suppose there is a family of probability distributions over uh, these random variables uh, parameterized by some set of coefficients uh, that we collectively denote by A. Then a common setup in learning theory and statistics is to use IID samples from the distribution PA to learn the parameter A uh, that fully specifies uh, this probability distribution. A well-known example of this is when the family of distributions over these variables is defined such that the probability of an assignment is proportional to the exponential of a cost function, which is obtained by multiplying the value of adjacent vertices and taking a weighted sum of them. There is also a normalization factor z uh, called the partition function, which is the sum of these uh, exponential factors. And so this setup is called the Ising model or the Boltzmann machine. And you can also assign weights not only to the edges but also to the vertices or consider more uh, general hypergraphs and cost functions. And then uh, you get what is called a graphical model. And the distributions you get this way are known as the Gibbs distributions. So in machine learning or learning theory in general, uh, there is a remarkable line of research that has resulted in algorithms for uh, learning such distributions with efficient time and sample complexity. Uh, these Gibbs distributions have a special property that is crucially used in these algorithms to get uh, efficient complexity. Uh, this property has to do with the way the variables are dependent on each other. Uh, so let me explain that in more details. Suppose we divide the vertices into three sets A, B, and C, such that the vertices in A are disconnected from uh, those in C. So in other words, the set B shields uh, the set A from C. Then condition on the variables in the set B, those in sets A and C are independent of each other, meaning uh, the mutual information between A and C uh, conditioned on B is zero. This is called the Markov property, and it's known that uh, this is a unique property of Gibbs distributions. Uh, this is usually called the Hammersley-Clifford theorem, and when it comes to learning, uh, this property somehow allows us to learn the parameters locally uh, and therefore efficiently. Uh, so this is all about classical probability distributions, and uh, we have a detailed understanding of how we can efficiently uh, learn these models. In this talk, I'll show you variants or generalizations of these models that appear in quantum physics and quantum computing. And due to their quantum nature, they exhibit interesting features that make devising learning algorithms for them very non-trivial. Okay, so let me tell you more about the setup. In the quantum setting, instead of probability distributions, we deal with quantum states or density operators which are positive semi-definite Hermitian operators with trace equals one. A special case of quantum states is the Gibbs state, uh, which similar to Gibbs distributions in previous slides is defined as the exponential of a certain cost function. Uh, this cost function in physics is known as the Hamiltonian. It is a Hermitian operator with exponential size in the number of vertices and it is a sum of local terms. Here, EKs are a set of operators that don't necessarily commute with each other, uh, and they act non-trivially only on the adjacent vertices. For instance, you can always set them to be a tensor product of Pauli operators. And we assume throughout the talk that they are fixed in a suitable way beforehand, and we know what they are. Uh, the coefficients mu k are called the interaction coefficient. Uh, we assume there are m of them, 
which for bounded degree graphs is of the order of the number of vertices n. This beta factor here is motivated by physics and corresponds to the inverse temperature uh, of the system. And I'll explain this in uh, more detail soon. Uh, finally, we call the normalization factor that makes uh, the trace of the gives a state equals one, uh, the quantum partition function. Uh, these quantum systems have very interesting features. Uh, for instance, the Markov property that I discussed before for classical models is known to be violated in its exact form for quantum systems. Uh, this and other peculiar features makes the study of these systems more difficult compared to their classical counterparts. And in particular, efficiently learning these quantum models, meaning learning the interaction uh, coefficients mu, or the Hamiltonian in general, has remained open. In this talk, I'll present the first sample efficient algorithm uh, for this problem. So before going on, let me uh, tell you more why we care about this problem in the first place. Uh, the first motivation comes from many body physics, where one thing we would like to figure out is the interactions between quantum particles encoded in the Hamiltonian uh, in a previously unknown or newly synthesized material. Now, suppose a quantum many body system is held at some fixed temperature T with a specific Hamiltonian H mu. Uh, these particles are in a quantum state, which is uh, the Gibbs state we saw in the previous slides, where beta is the inverse of the temperature of the system. To infer the interactions between uh, particles, one thing we can usually do is to perform simple local measurements uh, on these particles. And we would like to have algorithms that, given these measurements data, uh, learns the Hamiltonian of the system, uh, which is equivalent to learning the interaction parameters mu. Uh, OK, so that's one motivation. Another reason we care about this problem is in the context of verification of quantum computers. Uh, an important subroutine in various quantum algorithms is preparing and sampling from quantum Gibbs states. Uh, this is, for instance, used in quantum STC, STP solvers or uh, quantum annealing. So to verify whether a quantum computer is implementing uh, these algorithms faithfully or not, uh, we want classical algorithms that, given samples from the output of a quantum computer, uh, learns the implemented Gibbs state. Finally, given the advances in learning high-dimensional data using uh, machine learning, uh, there are a lot of interests in applying these techniques to problems in quantum computing and quantum physics, uh, where you often deal with the high dimensional state space. Uh, rigorously establishing uh, such connections for interesting problems is an active area of research. And as you'll see in the rest of the talk, a Hamiltonian learning problem is a good candidate for this purpose. Uh, there are already various previous proposals and experimental implementations of uh, learning Hamiltonians, uh, but they mostly lack rigorous performance guarantees. In particular, even putting aside the issue of time complexity, uh, finding a non-trivial bound on the sample complexity of this problem was open. Okay, so our main result answers this uh, by providing a sample efficient algorithm uh, for this problem. And more specifically, we show that to learn the interaction parameters mu1 uh, through mu m up to an error epsilon in the L2 distance, it suffices to have order m cubed over epsilon squared copies of the Gibbs state. Uh, there is also a prefactor depending on beta, the inverse temperature, which becomes uh, larger at very low or high temperatures, as intuitively expected. Uh, so we're assuming the Hamiltonian is a spatially local, meaning the interactions act on a constant number of particles that are in the neighborhood of each other. And therefore, m, the number of interactions uh, we have, is of the order n, the number of particles. All right, but how do we uh, prove this? 
Our proof has many ingredients, uh, which I now introduce one by one. Uh, the first ingredient is the concept of sufficient statistics, which is a function of the input data that contains all the information about the unknown parameters. For example, for Gaussian distributions, the sample mean and variance of the data are uh, sufficient statistics for learning the distribution. This notion can be also generalized to the quantum setting. Uh, so suppose we have access to identical copies of the quantum Gibbs state. It turns out that there are certain measurements that we can perform on these copies whose outcomes contain all the relevant information for learning the Gibbs state for its Hamiltonian. Or precisely by measuring the operators EK and taking their averages, we obtain the local expectations small EK, uh, which uniquely determine the Gibbs state. So again, remember that the operators EK are usually just a tensor product of a few Pauli operators. Uh, for instance, for classical Ising model, uh, these local expectations correspond to uh, the expectations of uh, the value of agents and vertices. Assuming we have uh, these local expectations EK, uh, there is a natural algorithm for uh, obtaining the Gibbs state. And this is called the maximum entropy optimization. Uh, the idea here is that among all the quantum states whose uh, local expectations match the given values EK, we choose the one that has the maximum von Neumann entropy. It can be shown that the output state of this optimization, which actually is a convex program, equals the original Gibbs state. And as we will see shortly, the interaction coefficients mu can be also obtained uh, in a similar way. Uh, the issue, however, with this uh, solution is that since we only have some finite number of copies of the Gibbs state, uh, the local expectations EK are not known exactly. And we only have uh, their estimated value E hat sub K, which involves some statistical error. And so uh, the important issue that remains is to show that uh, this approach is robust to such statistical errors. It's easier to analyze uh, this robustness if we instead look at the dual of this optimization. Here, the variables lambda are the Lagrange multipliers, and the objective function is a sum of the log of the partition function plus a linear term. As long as we have the exact values of the local expectations EK, the output of this dual program can be shown to be the interaction coefficients mu k. But again, the question is what happens when we use the estimated values? This problem is an instance of a, a stochastic convex optimization. And there is a property of the objective function g lambda called the strong convexity that can be used to analyze the robustness and the sample complexity. We say a function is alpha strongly convex if at any point we can lower bound it by uh, this quadratic function. Or equivalently, if the Hessian of this function, whose entries are the second order derivative, is lower bounded by alpha times uh, the identity operator. Uh, loosely speaking, this property allows us to relate a difference in the value of the function to a difference in the input variables. In our case, the deviation in the value of the function is caused by replacing the local expectations uh, with their estimated values. And the L2 difference of the inputs is the deviation uh, in the interaction coefficients caused by this. More formally, we can show that if the function is alpha strongly convex, then the error in the interaction parameter is at most order one over alpha times the error in the local expectations. The linear term in G lambda doesn't affect the strong convexity. So what we need is basically the strong convexity of uh, the log partition function. 
So our main technical contribution is improving this uh, for quantum partition function, meaning uh, the log partition function is a strongly convex uh, with parameter alpha being order one over n. I will shortly sketch the proof of this, but before that, let me show you how this implies the claimed sample complexity. The number of samples needed to estimate each local expectations EK with error delta scales as log m over delta I squared, which is similar to what you expect classically. Uh, then using the strong convexity we have, we see that uh, to have an overall error of epsilon for the interaction coefficients mu uh, in L2 norm, we need delta to be order epsilon over m to the 3 half. Uh, which implies besides the log factors and dependency on beta, an order n cubed over epsilon squared sample complexity. All right, now uh, let's see how the proof of the strong convexity works. I think it's insightful to begin with the case that the Hamiltonian is classical. For instance, uh, it could be the Ising model. Uh, in this case, actually a better strong convexity bound can be proven. Instead of order one over n, uh, the alpha parameter is just a constant. Uh, proving this is equivalent to uh, proving that for all real vectors v, this inequality holds. The entries of the Hessian are just the second order derivatives, and they're just equal to the covariance of the local operators we have. Uh, the overall sum then is just the variance of an operator that looks like a Hamiltonian with interaction coefficients given by the vector v. Now let's look at the graph corresponding to this Hamiltonian. And let's divide the vertices into two sets A and B such that the vertices in set A are mutually disconnected. And the set, the size of uh, A is a constant fraction of the total number of vertices. Due to the concavity of the variance, if we condition on the value of vertices in set B, uh, the expected variance lower bounds uh, the original value. And because the remaining vertices are all in the set A and they are independent of each other, the variance decomposes into a sum of the individual variances. Each of these variances are acting on a local region and are just a constant times uh, bk squared. So overall, we get the claim the strong convexity then. So as you see, there are two main steps in this proof. One is to write the Hessian in terms of a nice variance form. And one is to decompose the global variance as a sum of local conditional variances. These steps rely on the operators ek, uh, to commute with each other. And more importantly, in the second step, we basically use the conditional independence or the Markov property. As I explained earlier in the quantum case, neither of these facts hold anymore. Uh, to get around these issues and prove the strong convexity for quantum systems, we introduce several ideas. One is that we show that even though the sum of the second order derivatives has a very complicated expression and can't be exactly written as a variance of local operators, we can still lower bound it by a variance of a suitably defined operator. Where here E tilde k's are some quasi-local operators, meaning they're not exactly supported on a few vertices, but their support has an exponentially decaying tail. Adding this, we use multiple other structural properties of uh, quantum many-body systems to show that one can further lower bound this variance by the variance of a single local term. We actually don't get the variance of one of the E tilde terms, but roughly speaking, we get the variance of some other quasi-local operator uh, to some constant power. This operator W tilde K is related to the previous operators in a complicated way, but the point is that this term is a still uh, almost like a local variance. And therefore, we can lower bound it by a constant. And then by losing a factor of uh, 1 over m, we can 
relate this to the L2 norm of the initial vector. Note that compared to the classical case where we lower bounded the variance by some of order n many local terms, here we are lower bounding it by a single local term. And therefore, we get a weaker band of order 1 over m instead of a constant. To prove these bounds, we rely on techniques from many body physics, like quantum belief propagation and connecting global to local properties. And you can see more intuitive explanations of these in the introduction of our paper. OK, so in summary, we show that the number of samples needed for quantum Hamiltonian learning is order m cubed over epsilon squared. In our paper, we also show a lower bound of omega square root uh, over epsilon. And therefore, up to polynomial factors, our work settles the sample complexity. But as you might have noticed, uh, because we use things like the maximum entropy optimization, which is in the worst case MP hard to solve, our results don't imply a time efficient algorithm, except in certain regimes where the partition function can be efficiently evaluated, which for instance could be above some constant temperature. Uh, all right, here are some open questions left by our work. It would be interesting to improve our sample complexity bounds, uh, both the upper and the lower bound. Uh, improving the number of samples when the error uh, is measured in L infinity instead of L2, as done classically, uh, would be interesting too. And most importantly, developing time efficient algorithms for this problem uh, in the general case is it still wide open. Okay, these are the references I cited uh, during the talk. And with that, I thank you uh, for your attention.